1960s were unique and challenging times in German history. The West German nation, after a long search for identity and mission and knowing of its place in the world, was on the cusp of emerging in the forefront of the community of nations, surpassing again France, which was torn by riot and the increasing influence of the army in propping up Charles de Gaulle's faltering presidency, de Gaulle was to resign in 1969, and a soon to swiftly decay Britain as both an economic powerhouse and cultural centre of an emerging supranational Europe. The German philosophical and cultural heritage, both for better and for worse, was still the dominant tenor of Western European thinking, and German politics, foreign policy, and the formation of national character were guided by traditionally conservative German values. It was these conservative values which allowed the German people as a whole, in the interest of building a stable Western democracy, to collectively turn a blind eye to the very near past and the successive horrors of Weimar, the Third Reich, destruction, defeat and effective debellishment of Germany and the spectre of a communist bloc on their doorstep, as well as the pain and shame of division between West and East. Germany effectively became a nation without a historical memory, but dominated by a cultural one. By the late 1960s, however, both extreme left and right wing factions, small but well organised and resourced groups, had emerged from university campuses, which had started undertaking mass enrolments in the very late 1950s and had proven incapable of dealing with the numbers and the new attitude towards authority of students. The universities were run under the traditional German model, that is hierarchically and authoritarian, with little input for students to suggest changes, and the students questioned the Nazi past of many of the professors and the detached and abstract nature of humanities courses. Leftist students soon developed very effective tactics to provoke extreme reactions from conservative university administrators, and it was some years before universities learned how to make the small compromises required to keep things running day to day. The left and extreme rights tactic of street violence as a means of protest horrified the Gemachtige Leute, who recalled such tactics from the communists and SA in the 1920s and 30s. Relatively quickly, the protest movements radicalised against what they referred to as the Auschwitz generation, ending in such extreme organisations as the Red Army Faction or the Revolutionary Cells. Against this background, German popular music, as popular music around the world is wont to do, undertook a change. At the time the first German charts were published in 1959, there was a clear division between the Schlager artists, who played American-style rock and roll but with a more melodic edge to it, the German equivalent of show bands, who toured extensively and were reliable hit makers, and the British and American artists who recorded both in English and German, for example The Beatles, trained by TV host Camilo Fegelin, recorded She Loves You and I Want to Hold Your Hand. The situation on the campuses and in the artist collectives and on the streets, however, soon demanded its own soundtrack and a number of new bands emerged pursuing the heavy psychedelic sounds from the USA. But the new music, dubbed Cosmish Music, began to assimilate not only every kind of musical influence that could be incorporated, but every way in which it could arrange, organize and utilize sounds both created and found. The story that Krautrock was a disparaging term coined by the English music press is, however, not true. It did first appear in the NME in 1971, but as part of an ad placed by a Frankfurt-based music promoter seeking to distribute records. For the purposes of clarity, I'll refer to the music from here on in as Kosmisch, which is the term the musicians themselves used for it. One of the real problems in telling the story of Kosmisch is there's no central narrative to the music. No two bands ever stayed in the same place or even the same neighbourhoods for more than two albums in a row. And that's why the music is so much fun and so challenging, but it makes absolute judgments misleading and irrelevant. While Kosmisch is undeniably, for example, a branch of the progressive rock music, bands like Neuer or Kraftwerk, two of the most widely important and influential Kosmisch bands, have nothing to do with prog. And this is the key concept and the hardest thing I found to grasp about Kosmisch is it isn't a musical movement 
like country music or even something as multifaceted as jazz. It's more about a moment. It's more about collecting every single thing that was out there and trying to cover it all in a period of time. Over the forthcoming years, that vast scope was forced to narrow by the marketplace and the stabilizing social situation. But the spirit lingered for a long time and a lot of wonderful music thrived in an environment designed for it to thrive and evolve. Let's take a look, in no particular order, at some of the acts that helped define the moment and some of the more fascinating music they made. Hamburg Band. Lucifer's Friend was one of the earliest breakthrough exponents, reflecting the psychedelic hard rock roots of the music with some jazzy tinges. Lucifer's Friend would mix it up, however, each album pursuing a different musical theme or motif. Their debut, a synthesis of the psych and nascent metal sounds of the times. The follow-up, Where the Groobies Killed the Blues, which was much more a psych and prog vein, followed by Just a Rock and Roll single, which was more pared back rock in a grand funk style. And Banquet, full of a symphonic hard rock prog fusion. Today, Lucifer's friend are considered one of the pioneers of doom metal, whatever that may be, and goth. At very nearly the other end of the scale are the merry minstrels of Kosmisch, Grobschnitt, whose use of, at first, psych and prog textures, inventive musicianships and irreverent, surreal or just silly lyrics, combined with epic length high energy performances and a constant evolution thereafter, have made them one of the most highly regarded German acts. They evolved by the end of the 70s into a Mothers of Invention style act, mixing social commentary, parody and musical brilliance in albums like Merry-Go-Round and Voli Molly. Later, they became a pop rock act, playing 80s style DX7 drenched boppers, but still with a mischievous twinkle in their eyes. One of the emeritus members of the Cosmiche scene were Heidelberg's Guru Guru, who had a strong streak of free jazz in their music, but were also grounded in Jimi Hendrix, Arthur Brown, Cream, Frank Zappa, and Sid Barrett era Pink Floyd, along with a healthy dose of anarchic humor. Their albums up to 1976 are solid, approachable affairs. The debut UFO, 1972's Imaginative Kangaroo, and the fuzzy, unhinged self-title album, all come recommended. If there's one artifact of Cosmiche I strongly urge you to obtain, it's the soundtrack to Werner Herzog's 1972 film, Aguirre, The Wrath of God, which starred an utterly bonkers Klaus Kinski, and had a soundtrack by Munich-based Popol Vuh. Popol Vuh were masters of ambient textures in the early 1970s before evolving into an organic orchestral sound with exotic and world music influences. But Aguera, one of their four Herzog soundtracks, is a remarkable cross between limitless space rock and a claustrophobic electronic pulse which takes you back to the jungle and Aguera's madness. One of the most prickly and confronting acts of the Cosmic stable was Faust, a group who would use dissonance, found sounds, extreme tape abuse, psychedelia, and what these days would be called industrial rhythms to create arresting, compelling, and occasionally unlistenable music. As time went on, they made concessions to song format, although one suspects purely for the fun of subverting it. Their third album, The Faust Tapes, sold 50,000 copies in the UK, largely because it sold for 49p and introduced 50,000 Englanders to a 26 track, give or take, suite of end of times drumming, spoken word pieces, whimsical folk, backmasking and tunes that sounded a little like the Beatles, somewhat the worse for LSD. Their masterwork, however, is Faust 4, a positively moderate, at least as far as Faust goes, follow up to the tapes, full of wild and off kilter musical ideas that wedded to relatively conventional structures. It's fun and a worthy challenge for the slightly courageous listener. Amondul 2 brought a heavy intensity to the scene. Amundul II were in time very popular outside Germany and this led them to adopting formal song structures as opposed to their previous all improvised work. A long lasting combo who emerged at first from a Munich art collective which was called Amundul, hence the two, so great was their popularity that they were the first Cosmisch band to sign a major international distribution deal with Atlantic in 1975. Their albums Phallus Day, Yeti and Wolf City are all well worth checking out. Yeti verging on the indispensable. A short-lived but incredibly influential Neue came onto the scene in 1972 
with a stricter rhythmic formula and a more direct approach. An offshoot of Kraftwerk, their first two albums made such an impact on the Cosmish scene that they changed their mind of their former employers, who promptly moved on from a free-form music concrete style to begin work on their seminal album Autobahn. Noi, who only made three albums before breaking up, were instrumental in popularising the motoric beat, the instantly recognisable 4-4 four, four time, three beats on the bass and one on the snare which was repeated bar by bar with only occasional punctuation from a splash cymbal. The beat originated as an experiment from Jackie Liebesite of Khan on their second album, Soundtracks, but he played it much more aggressively and responsibly to other musicians, which Matoric does not allow. The first and third albums, Noi and Noi 75, come most highly recommended. The in-between album Noi 2 suffered just about every kind of disaster you could imagine befalling a record. Blazing rows between the bands, a ludicrous deadline and running out of money mid-project. But it still manages to be fascinating, but it lacks the killer hook of the motoric beat under rock dynamics of the other two. No discussion of Cosmish can be complete without their most famous, perhaps after Kraftwerk, representative. Khan, a Cologne-based collective who from 1969 through 1974 may have been the greatest rock band in the world, with a run of six albums that towered above anything in terms of ambition and execution in the English-speaking rock world. Their masterpiece is Targo Mago, but Monster Movie, Ege Bamiyazi and the smoky, ambient-directed Future Days, which even found time to slip in a cheeky shot at a hit single, are all essential works all utter delights to try and unpick and take in everything on them. They are amongst the cornerstones of rock music post-1975, and anyone who is in any way interested in a complete investigation of what rock music was in the post beatle era needs to be listening to Khan. One of the most beloved and well-known of Cosmic groups is Tangerine Dream. Nowadays famous for their Hollywood movie soundtracks, their first eight albums are all inseparably wondrous, some of the most intricately textured music ever created. The first two albums are a little wild, which makes them exciting and fun, but by their third album, the Tangerine Dream formula is in place. Sweeping synth passages, radical reharmonization, and sections which seem to be just pure ether. They're moving away from avant-garde here into the realm of space rock, or just space. Rock has nothing to do with it. Phaedra is mind-blowing, the live ricochet is a dreamscape, and the concluding album in the run Stratosphere is breathtaking and goes beyond any critical references. A great, unclassifiable, and limitlessly fascinating catalogue is Tangerine Dream. Finally, the band which, perhaps unfairly, came to represent the limited view of what most people's idea of Cosmish was. Kraftwerk. Originally an avant-garde music concrete, almost ambient group who made three albums of dense, challenging music, the success of ex-members Klaus Dinger and Michael Ruther in Neu prompted band leaders Ralph Herter and Florian Schneider to disavow their previous work and shift direction radically, resulting in perhaps one of the greatest albums ever made, 1974's Autobahn. Autobahn kicked off a five album run where the parameters for electronic music and all its offsprings were redefined, away from the ambient stylings of Adelia Derbyshire to a potent commercial sound. The band took five years off then, working on various other projects until 1986's profoundly disappointing Electric Cafe, which demonstrated that at that point, the students had surpassed the masters. Autobahn obviously is an essential element in any well-balanced record collection, but equally Trans-European Express is also wonderful, life-affirming and aspirational music. Cosmish had a wide-ranging and enduring influence outside of Germany, both on contemporary artists and as a touchpoint for today's artists to look back on. The Stooges were early adopters of Kahn's style. David Bowie, of course, heard Faust, Neu and Popol Vuh. US New Wave bands such as Suicide and Pear Ubu incorporated elements from Faust and Can. And whole generations of English popsters were bewitched by craft work, which led to the great synth-pop breakout of the early 1980s. In Australia, one of our most popular bands, Hunters and Collectors, took their name from a Khan track. Radiohead, Joy Division, 
Mars Volta, Stereo Lab, all bands that draw directly on the bloodlines of the great cosmic music that burst, prospered and left an indelible legacy in the 10 years from 1968 to 1978. I hope you can take some time to investigate the playlist and get a sense for this music, perhaps even a curiosity for it, and perhaps and I hope an appreciation for music that most people have only ever heard secondhand as an echo in the work of more popular artists. <laughs>